intense attention to something is this idea that I've been thinking on a lot, um, especially as I've been working on these really small paintings. I've kind of just been following this theme of, of detail and um, just going slowly and figuring out how to create something really small and beautiful. And these paintings are um, essentially really meditative, I guess, when I'm working on them. And so it's just got me thinking about thinking and thinking about attention and what that means for art and um, how to create art, but now also like how to read and interpret art. And this reminded me of a literary critic that I read in grad school. Her name is Toral Moy and she wrote this book called Revolution of the Ordinary. And it's so interesting because she's very bold in unraveling some of the academic speak and the complexities and um, kind of challenging our assumptions about how to read fine art and literature. And instead of forcing interpretations or taking some sort of complex scholarly lens, um, she just breaks it down and makes it so, so human. And some of her words have always stuck with me since grad school. And now as a creator and an artist, they just ring more true. So in the humanities, when it comes to academic research and writing and reading and even teaching, you pretty much have to have a um, lens or a reading theory that helps you look at a piece of art or a piece of literature and see patterns that you wouldn't have otherwise seen or reveal something about the culture or social issues that maybe are overlooked. But even over time, all these reading theories that were meant to reveal um, issues that took away freedoms in art and literature and culture, um, they themselves became really rigid. And I think the interesting thing about Toro Moy is that she doesn't disregard the ability of these reading theories to um, shed important light on things, but she integrates the approach in a much more human and communicative and lived-in sort of way. I mean, I'm kind of speaking in broad strokes, but the interpretation of art and literature has kind of become a little bit more focused on what's wrong with the piece or the author or the culture. Like, it seems to take the term criticism um, in its most literal and negative definition, I suppose, um, instead of just approaching an artwork and just being with it and just listening and understanding it objectively before judgments are made. like. Academic work demands that you come to an artwork with a pretense. And certainly it's not to say that this is bad, because academic work has done so much to uncover things that have been just ingrained into our culture, especially since historical periods, um, that we have been able then to work to undo. And we've come such a long way, I think. But now, because we're so used to always looking for something negative, it has created such a deep sense of ingrained cynicism that I think has made the whole art making process and reading and understanding art just a little bit less human. Ironically, in an attempt to make art more human and more honest. I think maybe the biggest issue is that for every strong action, there is going to be a very strong reaction. And so when it comes to art interpretation, if you focus too much on the negative, I think it's possible to unravel and deconstruct an artwork so much that there's just nothing left. But on the other hand, if you focus too much on the beauty, it can seem inauthentic and appear as if you're turning a blind eye to some of the harder truths. And so I think the undercurrent in the book The Revolution of the Ordinary 
Uh, the argument is not about saying which approach is better or worse or anything like that, but rather Toromoi brings it down to the level of a human conversation again. I think as people who consume art and even as people who make art, we tend to forget that there is another person on the other side of the equation. I really love how Toromoi puts it herself. She says, Sentences, utterances, texts don't generate themselves. They are spoken or written by someone at a particular time in a particular place, and the words reveal the speaker. Utterances, like other actions, have consequences, ripple effects spreading far beyond the original moment of utterance. Okay, so speaking of paying careful attention to things, let's take a little break from all the art interpretation theory and come antiquing with me. I love doing this, it's kind of a little hobby, and I'm generally looking for frames I can use for my artwork, but I'm also open to surprises along the way. Frames can be so expensive, so I'm always hoping that I'll find um, something decent. And I loved this frame, it was big and beautiful and bold, but since it was a mirror, it was actually really expensive and unfortunately not quite worth it. These dishes and cups are special. They're flow blue process, um, so if you look really closely, you can see that the patterns have a little bit of a haze around them. And so the way that these are made in like the 18th and 19th centuries is um, they'd actually take copper plates and carve in the copper plate as if they were going to make a print on paper. And they would actually make the print on like something akin to tissue paper, put them over the vessel, and it would have a glaze on it instead of ink. And the pattern would transfer to the vessel and you'd put them in water so that the um, tissue paper kind of would float up and not like totally smear the design and then it would have this nice like hazy effect that kind of makes it very beautiful and sort of ethereal. I love this booth because they have the best frames and they're usually smaller sizes which usually work for my pieces really well and I spotted this frame that I loved. Um, it's not particularly old but it is just so pretty and I have a frame that's really similar to it in just a larger size but it's not quite the right size. It's actually a four by four and not a five by five. And I really was looking for a five by five for these recent little butterfly paintings. I did consider getting it just to have on hand, but I don't know when I'm gonna paint that size in the future. Of course, a good antique book will always catch my attention, and this is a collection of Tennyson's works in volumes, and it's from the 1890s, which is uh, just about contemporary with Tennyson, and I loved it. It even had like the pages that were dipped in um, like an ink pattern sort of thing, and um, it was beautiful. But you know, it was priced accordingly, so not much of a deal there, unfortunately. The second antique store I go to often is so beautiful, it is just so gorgeously curated and all the vendors have such a good eye, but it's also not really a place where I can find great deals because things are usually priced at market or above market, although in the past I have found some gorgeous like late 18th, early 19th century botanical prints, so I'm always on the lookout for that. But identifying like an authentic antique print that has come from like a copper plate and put through a printing press and then hand watercolored is um, actually really tricky and I couldn't do it without taking it out of the frame so I just passed on that one. I did see these really cool like art magazine or portfolio type things um, and they seem kind of vintage and the prints were pretty decent um, but I'm kind of picky about art books if I you know buy them at all because it's just so easy to like look things up on the internet um, which I know isn't the best um, but yeah they just weren't in the greatest condition and I would have loved like a larger print I think if I were gonna get something like that. So 
So if you're into collecting antique prints that come from a printing press, just be super careful because they're really good nowadays at making it look like it's old when it's not. But if you look closely and it looks hand watercolored, but if you look even closer and you can see little tiny like pixels, then you know that it's from a modern printing type of deal. Um, and generally at that point, it just would be for decoration, not necessarily for collecting. So I knew most of these are pretty much like modern prints, um, and I thought maybe I could get lucky and find something really old. And one surefire way to tell if a print is like from a plate and rent through a printing press is the plate impression. And um, I don't see any now, but um, I found like pages from a musical composition book, and this one did seem to be actually printed from a plate. Um, I'll show you in just a second, like what it kind of looks like if. You can see just a gentle indent kind of along the frame of the main text or image or whatever. Um, you can pretty much know like that that was printed from a plate, like yeah, and you can even feel that indent. And so that's a really great way to know if it's actually old or not. And of course, there are still artists and printmakers that use plate printing, so it doesn't mean it's guaranteed to be old, but at that point, you'd kind of look at the paper and how the paper is aging, and this one is definitely old. I'm sure it's 19th century or maybe early 20th. So I guess whether it's antiquing or painting, I don't know, these are just things in my life that are exercises in just having patience and taking time to observe what's in front of you just without a bias and just seeing things for what they are, um, good, bad, beautiful. And then opinions and analysis can come after that. And I think that this really is like my painting process. Like when I'm starting and I'm painting a butterfly or a leaf, I really am just trying to figure out what the details are and, and putting them down. And then it's more about how it's going to fit into the larger project as a whole and how it's contributing to just the sense of beauty and the story and the philosophy that I'm trying to comprehend. So it's both objective and then subjective in the art making process. And this is kind of how I try to approach conversations with people and I'm nowhere near perfect, but there's a time for listening, and then there's a time to lay out your perspective, and um, it just goes in this really beautiful symbiotic cycle without too much force. And I guess this is also how I hope that people see my artwork too. They just approach it and try to see a part of me that I'm trying to communicate, and then they can also allow things to stick out to them and speak to them in ways that I maybe never would have thought of. And I really think that treating art interpretation as a living conversation can help us circumvent excess cynicism. I think because of the way we've been trained to understand art and literature, in some ways that's affected us. Like, we come to literature and art with skepticism, and then we kind of automatically come to other people with skepticism, just because, you know, it's said that we can't truly understand 100% what someone else is feeling and experiencing in the same way that we do. You know, we can never truly step into someone else's shoes. And, and that is objectively true, but I also think it overlooks, like, the power of human empathy, and it kind of leads to a sort of defeatism. I think there's this sort of negative zeitgeist that's floating around that says, if it can't be known, how much should we bother trying to know? But I think trying to know is the most important, brave thing we can do for each other.
What would change, I wonder, if we more regularly thought of artwork as a delayed conversation? I mean, we're literally seeing the ideas of one mind being translated into a certain medium, whether it's painting or drawing or anything like that, a poem even, and we're picking it up and bringing it into our own minds. And um, yeah, information is lost along the way, some intention is lost along the way, but a lot of intention is found and a lot of connection is made. I mean, conversations, they're living, they're ongoing. And this is where Toro Moy's idea of attention and interpretation is so powerful. She writes, To attend to something is to direct the mind of the senses towards something, to apply oneself, to watch over, minister to, wait upon, follow, frequent, wait for, await, expect. The idea of caring for or serving others converges on the idea of listening, waiting, and watching. And none of this is really easy. It's not easy to undo years of skepticism, skepticism when it comes to interpreting art and interpreting other people. I mean, especially when that skepticism and cynicism can have a lot of value and reveal a lot of truth and um, hard things that we need to see. I think that a certain amount of purging is really necessary, and uh, there's a lot of wisdom in that too. Difficult, cold wisdom that's really important when we're making art and interacting with others in the world. But at the same time, if that's all that we see, then our vision can be really skewed too. I think it leads to a lot of fear and judgment, and those things tend to happen when we're trying to preserve ourselves. But it takes some self confidence and a little bravery to learn in conversation. The final couple of chapters in Revolution of the Ordinary are my favorite because it's where Toro Moy takes all that she's written about and researched and critiqued gently and she culminates it in a really simple approach to interpretation and to just people in general. She calls this approach a just and living gaze. And you know, Toro Moy is not naive, far from it. In addition to describing all these things, she also writes that love is not the same thing as warmth and compassion. Too much sympathy can blind us to reality. The whole wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove comes to mind here, because ultimately, attention, she writes, is neither striving nor self-promoting. It tries to understand, not to destroy, to manage to see another human being with the openness of genuine attention is truly difficult. She quotes Simone Veil here and says, It is almost a miracle. It is a miracle.